Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeannie Alter. I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association, and I'm so thankful that you all are joining us today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, ASHA and who we are. Uh, the mission of the American School Health Association is to transform all schools into places where every student learns and thrives. And the association envisions healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments, nurtured by caring adults and functioning within coordinated school and community support systems. We want to let you know that we are uh, holding our 93rd annual school health conference in Cincinnati, October 2nd through 4th, 2019. So mark your calendars, and uh, we hope to see you in Cincinnati. Just a little bit about uh, the benefits of being a member of the American School Health Association. We have our Journal of School Health, which is our peer-reviewed journal, uh, sort of a, uh, a point of pride for us. Um, so uh, all members get access to the journal available print and online. You get access to information and expertise uh, through our annual conference. We have a bi-weekly newsletter and we have four networking communities. In addition, all members receive uh, free continuing education credits for things such as the conference and webinars like this today. We also have a career center and members get discounted rates for job postings. And we also recently um, announced that we have ASHA members can receive a 15% discount on all American Academy of Pediatrics publications. So it's my honor today to uh, introduce our presenter, Dr. Mary Casa Petraco. Um, she is a clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University School of Nursing in Stony Brook, New York, and a primary care provider in her own primary practice, private practice. So she's a busy lady. Uh, she's also a nurse consultant on the staff of the Immunization Action Coalition and is nationally, a nationally known expert in immunization practice and has been the advisor for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and served on the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. During her long career working in a county health department, she advised local and state health departments on immunization public policies using her expertise as a public health nurse to influence system level changes. Dr. Koslet Petreko is the PKIDS online advice nurse and a member of the executive board of Every Child by Two. She authored chapters in three textbooks and written numerous articles in professional and parenting publications. She holds and has held positions in NAPNAP, the NPA, and Nurse Practitioner Association of Long Island. She is a fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, and we welcome her today to um, tell us a little bit more about HPV vaccination. So welcome. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very, very much. Let me just change to share the screen so we can get up my slides open. Okay, can you see this? Can everybody see this, the slides? Okay, Caitlin, can you let me know if they can see the slides, please? Mary, I am not seeing your slides. Okay, oh. hold on a second. Yep. Let, me, let me just do escape and start again. Sure. And you'll need to click the share screen button in Zoom. I did click the share screen, but I might have clicked it too soon. All right, minimize. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to put share screen up. Can you see, are, are you seeing the, um, the home screen? No. Okay. We can, uh, if you need us to, we can share from our screen. Okay, you share, from, go ahead, because I don't want to hold them up. Share. 
Okay. All right. Um, I can you share from so I can see where you are on the on the slides. Okay, I can see. Okay, we're good. All right. Next slide, please. All right. I'm not going to read the objectives because you guys can all go over those yourselves. But what we're going to do today is review HPV vaccine. The reason why we continue to give these lectures is because we're not doing as good a job as we could nationally in order to get this vaccine into children. And one of my personal goals is to make everybody who has anything to do with school a real champion to encourage parents to get their children to get to take this vaccine. It's usually not mandatory in most of the states, but in my opinion, um, and I'll, I'm going to tell you some of those stories why, I think it should be mandatory for everybody. And we have some new information about the vaccine now as well. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. There's different types of HPV um, that cause cancers. We have the most common ones. The 16 and 18, as you can see there, are the most common ones, and they are responsible for the cervical cancers, the, re the anal cancers, the head and neck cancers, and the low-grade dysplasias that we see in the cervix. Um, also, um, a lot these, um, these strains are responsible for most of the genital warts and laryngeal papillomas. Laryngeal papillomas are a really big issue, especially for babies. If a mom has HPV um, uh, virus, uh, and that she has a vaginal delivery, the baby could be born with laryngeal papillomas. And there's not a whole lot that we can do for that. They, they, they kind of just have to keep, keep um, um, take, removing these surgically until they don't come back anymore. And then there are the skin infections, which are the common hand and foot warts. And those are some other types. Next slide. Most males and females are gonna be infected with at least one type of HPV sometime in their lives. That's huge. 79 million Americans are currently infected. 14 million new infections. HPV is the most common infection that people get in their teens and early 20s. And most people don't even know that they've been infected because thankfully, most people go on to shed this virus on their own. But if you're one of the unlucky ones, um, you could be the person who goes on to develop cancer. Next slide, please. These data, I think, are really compelling. 91% um, of the cervical cancer is, re, uh, is responsible from, with these viruses. Vaginal cancers, cancer of the vulva, 69% um, of cancer of the vulva is caused by HPV. Anal cancer, look at that number, 91%. Um, I, I know we've all heard, I, uh, heard about um, different actors and actresses who've had issues and, and had these cancers. So it, it's non-discriminatory, it hits everybody. And oral pharyngeal, 70%. We can literally wipe out head and neck cancers if we can get this vaccine into everyone. Next slide. These are the HPV uh, associated cancers by sex, race, and ethnicity. And if you look there, um, you'll see it's, it's pretty, it's pretty non-discriminatory. It goes after everybody. Um, but we certainly do have issues with, um, with our ethnic groups who don't always want to get vaccinated. So we have to really make sure that we are cu culturally sensitive and encourage them to be vaccinated as well. Next slide. These are the oral pharyngeal cancers. Um, look at these numbers. Um, and please look towards the end there. If you look at the non-Hispanic and the Hispanic uh, cultural groups, they are some of the highest rates of head and neck cancers. Also the African-Americans. Um, we need to get to all of our different ethnic groups to tell them that this cancer can, these cancers can affect them as well. Next slide. Um, these are race and ethnicity in the United States um, from 09 to, to, to 13. And if you look there, um, these, when you look at these ethnic rates for these, this particular um, date range, the, our African American and Hispanic groups have some of the highest rates. So we really do need to get a good education program out to them so we vaccinate their children. Next. These are the cervical cancer rates by race and ethnicity. And again, look at the black and Hispanic bars. They're higher than everybody else. So we really do need to get this vaccine into them. Next. Cervical cancer is the most common HPV associated cancer among women. Um, 528,000 cases, 266,000 deaths worldwide, 12,000 cases, 
and 4,000 cases in the US. Um, you know, as a public health nurse, I used to say to myself, well, we can't just be thinking about the women in the United States. So we do have to think about the women in the developing countries as well. And I asked the drug companies what's available for them. And they assured me that there is vaccine available for them, but they have the same problems that we have here is getting that vaccine into everybody. We certainly can do better. Next slide. This is the big issue. Um, Pre-cervical, precancerous changes in the cervix, um, these low-grade cervical dysplasias, and it's usually found in young women. 330,000 cases of high-grade um, and 1.4 million of low-grade. The problem with this is um, young women are going to have people poking at their cervix to do the, um, the, the colposcopies, and every time they start poking at that cervix, it weakens the cervix and lessens their chance on, of carrying a baby to term in the future. So it's really not just um, going full blown on cancer, it's preventing any of these pre-cervical changes as well. Next. This is a really great poster that CDC has. And if you see this sli whole slide deck came, comes from my friends at CDC, um, you can get this for your office. Um, and it's a great thing to hang on the wall because it really starts the conversation. Next. So we're going to talk a little bit about the vaccine itself. Uh, this is a picture of the particle, of the HPV particle. Um, it's a recombinant L1 capsid protein that forms this virus-like particle. It's not infectious. It's not oncogenic. But it really produces a high level of antibody. Um, in, in fact, a much better protection than natural infection does. Next. So CDC is recommending routine vaccination at 11 to 12 to prevent cancers. We can give this vaccine as young as nine. Um, and the, the advantage of starting at this age is they only need two doses instead of three. Another advantage is they have a much better immune response at this age. Uh, when they are on the two dose schedule, the first one is given say today and then six months from today, they would give the second dose. If it's given sooner than five months um, by accident because somebody didn't check the registry, um, then they have to have the third dose because you have to have at least four months between the second and third doses. Next, please. Um, the catch up or late, uh, we can vaccinate women uh, through 26 years of age. Now this slide, I didn't change it, but I got more slides for you later because now we can give it to people up to 45 years of age. So generally speaking, um, it's for uh, women through 26 and males through 21 who weren't previously vaccinated. And, but you can use a, this vaccine for any male 20 through two through 26 years of age, especially our children and men who are uh, having sex with, uh, with men, transgender people and other immune compromising conditions such as HIV. We wanna make sure that we protect them because they are more at risk than if they are heterosexual. Next slide, please. So these are our dosing schedules, but just keep this in the back of your mind because I'm going to show you um, for the older the the dosing schedule for um, the 26 through 45 year olds on a substance on a subsequent slide. So if we start this vaccine before the 15th birthday, um, that is a wonderful thing because then we only need to give them two doses. Now the big problem with this vaccine is it hurts. Warn them it hurts. Um, tell them to go home and put cold water on a washcloth and put that on their arm and move their arm. Because if you don't tell them, they're going to think that they're going to die from the sore arm. You know how adolescents are. So just warn them. Uh, so if you only have to give them two shots, that's one less sore, painful vaccine you have to give them. And the minimum interval is five months. If you violate that minimum interval of five months, then you're going to have to go on to the three dose schedule. Once they hit the 15th birthday, they do have to have three doses. The first one is given, and then the second one is one to two months after that first dose. And then the third dose is given um, no sooner than four months later, because you want to have six months between the first and the third, and no less than, um, no less than uh, four months between the second and the third. So the minimum interval between dose one and dose two on the three dose schedule it, uh, dose one and dose three is five months. Okay, next slide. So new recommendation for the adults. I just threw these slides in here. On, December, on October 9th, the FDA approved Gardasil 9 or HPV 9 
for an expanded recommendation to include people ages 27 through 45. Yippee! This is what my, my, um, my friends and colleagues who are in the women's health arena have been begging for for I don't know how long. Um, it's important, it's an important opportunity to stop the HPV related diseases and cancers in a broader age range. We know in the society that we live in now that we see people um, who are suddenly monogamous at later stages in their lives and our um, OBGYN colleagues really didn't have anything to offer them to protect them. Uh, why are they going to use protection? They're not going to use a condom. They probably are postmenopausal. Maybe they're using, um, if they're not, they're using uh, oral contraceptives. So they're not worried about using a condom. And suddenly they find themselves being uh, with these SIN1 changes because they're precancerous. Next. Um, oh, I see a, a question here. For 27 to 45, what if they have already been exposed? Well, um, the answer to that question is vaccinate them anyway, because they've probably only got one of those strains and you can protect them against the other. It will not um, prevent, it, it will not cure someone who's, who's already infected with one of the strains, but it will certainly prevent them from coming down with one of the others. Now, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the studies that they've done in this age group. Um, uh, uh, and these are the studies upon which they made the recommendations. They looked at about 3,200 women, 27 through 45 years of age, and they followed them for 3.5 years. And it was 88% protective in the prevention of, uh, uh, um, for, for protection against the strains that are covered by the vaccines. So, which means is it wasn't just protecting them about can against cancer, it was also protecting them against warts. Um, they didn't see any development of the precancerous lesions, any of those SIN1 changes, or any of the, the, the cellular changes that, were related, um, that are covered by the types covered in the vaccine. Next, please. Uh, really quick, we have a question from Amy. She asked, how many of the 40 strains does it protect them from? It protects them. That's why we call it Gardasil 9, um, because it protects them against those strains that are in the vaccine. Um, it, we started out with, two, there were two vaccines. One was two and one was four. And those were the most common anti uh, strains of cancer. Now we're able to protect them. That's why we call it um, HPV 9 now, because it's protecting against nine strains. It's still got the original four strains, but then they've added those additional strains um, that we probably would have started to see uh, cancers related to in the future, but they were not the most, they're not the most common ones, but certainly are oncogenic strains. Next slide, please. So this is the efficacy data for the 27 to 45 year olds. Um, it was based on these results and new data and some long-term follow-up that, that the FDA gave this recommendation. So the effectiveness in Gardasil 9 in men through tw 27 through 45 years of age, they, they used some inferred data from the women 27 through 45 years of age because it's still the same virus. So as well as the efficacy data that they had in the younger men with the 16 to, uh, to 26 year old men. So they kind of extrapolated from that data to say they believe it's going to work in the men as well. They also had immunogenicity data from a small clinical trial of 150 men, 27 through 45, who got the three dose over six months. And they got the same results that they would have expected to see um, had the, the study been larger. Next, oh, safety data. All right, so here's the safety data because we always want to make sure we go over safety data. It was evaluated in about 13,000 males and females, and the most common side effect they saw were site, ejection site pain, swelling and redness, and some headaches. And like I said, warn them, warn them, warn them that this is going to hurt when you give it and hurt for a few days later. I always tell the children, you're going to feel like I punched you in the arm for the next couple of days. Next, please. All right, so we're going to go over the HPV safety in the younger children. Next, please. All right, in the United States, we have the uh, vaccine safety system. We have VAERS, we have the vaccine safety data link. We have CISA. CISA is the clinical immunization safety, clinical immunization safety assessment project. Um, and I'm gonna go and describe these. And we also have the post licensure um, monitoring system as well. 
Vayers, I hope you're all familiar with Vayers. That's our frontline um, reporting system. Um, uh, we were just speaking previously before we got started and um, one of our um, sponsors mentioned that um, she knew somebody who had had um, uh, G B Gillian Barre related to a uh, to a vaccine to uh, influenza vaccine. Now it, that is one of the very rare side effects to influenza vaccine. But my first question was, well, was it related to Vayers? Was the person sent to the CISA center um, to investigate? Because GBS is not just caused only by influenza vaccine; it can be caused by other things as well. So we want to really make sure that we are when we speak about a vaccine reaction we are speaking about one that is a true reaction and has been investigated. Um, the vaccine safety data link is this large database system where we, we watch what's popping up uh, with what people are reporting. And the CESA project or CESA centers, um, there are seven academic centers sp uh, spread throughout the United States. I live in New York and I'm really familiar with the one that we have at Columbia University. And, um, you can, anybody can refer a patient to them. You can go online and get the information. If you think you've got somebody who's got a vaccine reaction, please send them to the CESA Center. Let those wonderful, sta the wonderful staff there work them up and make sure that it is a, a true reaction. And if it is, they will offer the care for them there as well. Because if somebody has a reaction to a vaccine, they are entitled to compensation from the, vac uh, from the uh, uh, vaccine injury compensation program. And then, of course, we do the post-licensure um, um, studies as well, to, to, which is another large database with over 170 million individuals to see if anything pops up. Um, and can I see that question again? At what rate was true um, adverse events, I believe? Um, th the adverse events, uh, I'm going to get into that next slide on the next slide to let you know how many... Um, how many people have had those adverse events. As I mentioned before, the most common adverse event with this vaccine is the sore red arm. Next slide, please. Okay, so the vaccine is safe. The reaction after the vaccine may include injection site pain, redness, or swelling. Um, the vaccine should not be given to anyone who's had an allergic reaction or has an allergy to yeast. Honestly, in all my years of doing this, I've never seen one. Um, but there is data that says that it can occur. And of course, the big thing, it, with, especially with our adolescents, are those fainting spells. They hold their breath and they get nervous and you, they don't eat and they don't have anything to drink and you give them a vaccine that's painful and you better have them sitting down because they're gonna go right out on you. So just make sure that they're seated and you keep an eye on them for 15 minutes after you give the vaccine. Um, I also had some adolescents who were known fainters so those children were laying down when we gave the vaccine. Next, please. Okay. Um, so this is the outcome. Um, somebody, someone asked me for the exact number of uh, reactions we have. Um, I, I think I had it on one of the previous slides. And if that, if you don't see it there, um, I, 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 you know, I have a deck that's like 120 slides, so I sometimes don't put them all in. And if you really want to know the exact statistic, um, just let me know and I will look that up for you. All right, so what's the outcome, the, the impact? Um, early outcome is we're going to prevent HPV, we're going to prevent genital warts. Middle to uh, decades later, we're going to prevent those SIN1 changes and the precancerous lesions. Um, and the late outcomes decades later is, are the cancers. Next. Okay, this is prevalence of HPV before and after introduction in the United States. Now, we're not doing a hot, such a hot job, but we've still seen a drop in these um, SIN1 changes and um, this cervical cancers just on this, the, the minimal job that we are doing getting the vaccine. If the 14 to 19 year olds, we've already seen a 64% decline in children who have had all of the vaccines. And you can see the difference there between that 03, 06 time period and the 09 and 012 period. Um, in the 20 to 24 year old gr uh, age group, 34% decline um, because some of those ch um, have been vaccinated as well. Um, in the 25 to 29 year old age group, 
we haven't seen as much of a decline because we haven't gotten that many of that age group vaccinated. So I'm hoping that those, not the, that those declines are really going to increase now that we can use the vaccine for the older, um, for older persons. Next, please. So what's the impact of uh, HPV vaccination in Australia? In Australia, this vaccine is mandatory. They have virtually eliminated head and neck cancers. Uh, the proportion of Australian females and males diagnosed of having genital warts has dropped dramatically. As Can you see those lines there in, the, in those different age groups? Every one of those lines has gone down. And the boys as well. This is really a huge drop. Um, the percentages are going down to four, less than 4% since we're doing, Australia has done such a good job of vaccinating. Next slide. So they did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of population level impact of the vaccines. They reviewed 20 studies in nine high-income countries. In countries with 50% coverage, they had an at least a 68% decrease in the 13 to 19 year olds on those two strains that are the most common that cause cancer. Anal genital warts was decreased by greater than 61%. They also are seeing evidence of herd immunity. Who would have thought we were gonna see herd immunity? And there's some evidence of cross protection against these other types. Next. So the duration, that's a big thing. We've been, we have these longitudinal studies going on and we know that the vaccine lasts for at least 10 years. And we still have more studies. I mentioned those studies earlier that we're still continuing to watch as, the, as years go out. Next. All right, now this is about how we're gonna talk about the, the vaccine. This is very near and dear to my heart, um, getting people vaccinated. My grandmother died in 1955 from cervical cancer. Well, in those days, they weren't doing very many pap smears. So she had the miserable third world death that we've only read about and we want to protect William, w women globally from. It really was horrible. Um, that's why I'm still Mary Koslov because that was her name and I refuse to give the name up because she's my inspiration. Um, you, well, Okay, um, I think you can see pictures now too. <laughs> okay, if someone had the series as a child, do they need another series later in life? That's a great question. And that data that I just showed you before, no, they do not. And the younger we vaccinate them, the better the immune response. But we have studies that are already 10 years old and there has been absolutely no drop in the immune response to this vaccine. So we wanna get them early so that we protect them for their lives. Um, we also have another family member, um, a, um, a uh, another male family member who had tonsillar cancer uh, from HPV. He survived, but it sure wasn't pretty. So this is why we need to know how to get this message across to our patients so that they accept the vaccine. Next slide, please. All right. Now this is adolescent vaccination coverage in the United States. All right, look how great we're doing with Tdap, 90%. Uh, meningitis vaccine, we're in the high 80s. Um, HPV1, um, 60s for females. HPV1 for boys, eh, mid 40s. Um, and then when we start seeing how we're doing to get the multiple doses, we start to see that precipitous drop. Mid 30s for the girls for three doses. And this, is, this um, data was collected before we started only doing two for the boys. And three for the boys is mid 20s. All right, can I see that question again, if, please? Um, if someone would please just, uh, uh, I was looking at the slide and reading the slide, so I didn't see that question that was just submitted. So, so they, that, oh, there's two of them. So. Okay, good. Go ahead. Someone asked, Nancy asked, do they need the Gardasil 9 if they receive the earlier version? That's a terrific question too. And I get that question all the time. No, they do not for two reasons. First of all, the, the original Gardasil or the original Cervarix, which was the two strain, covered the most common causes of, um, of cancer and the Gardasil 4 car also covered the warts. And that vaccine is so good it's going to protect them for their lifetime. They, there is also some cross protection in those earlier vaccines. So they are good. They don't need anything more. And what was the other question? 
And then Jordana asked, if someone only had part of the series earlier, but no records to show which, what should providers do? Okay. If you have, it doesn't matter what they had earlier. If they didn't finish the series, you are going to pick up where you left off with whatever you have with, with the Gardasil 9. Um, there, if, if it just says HPV vaccine, and then you're just going to be worried about your intervals. If they had only one, you would give the second one immediately. And then four months later, you would give the third one. Um, and it, like I said, it doesn't really matter what they had previously. It just matters how many doses they had is where you're going to pick it up. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now this is the impact of eliminating missed opportunities by age 13 and girls born in 2000. This is really dramatic. We only got 47%. We could be in the night. We could be over 90% if we didn't miss opportunities. That whatever they come in for, if they come for a cold, if they come for their school physical, if they come because they had a strep throat, if they come for their working papers, please vaccinate them. Honestly, I wish we could get the orthodontists to vaccinate the children because they're in the orthodontist's offices all the time and the dermatologists as well because they come in for their acne. So we really need to be very proactive about using every single opportunity that we see these children to vaccinate because we know they don't come in often enough. Next. All right. So why don't parents get their HPV for their children? Just look at that. I think we really should be ashamed of ourselves because the biggest issue is the provider didn't mention it or didn't recommend it. I made VFC visits in, um, in my, when I was a public health nurse for years. And one of my jobs was to try to get the providers to increase their HPV rates. And they would say to me, oh, they're too young. The parents don't want to talk about it. I don't even bring them up. Um, I have a poster out there, and if the parent mentions it, then I will. And what the parents are saying to us is, well, you didn't tell me about it, so I didn't even know. So maybe, I, I, maybe my decision would be to vaccinate if we talked about it. Next slide, please. All right. So this is the value parents place on vaccines. They think their vaccines are important. They also trust us. Next slide, please. And we as clinicians underestimate the value parents place on vaccines. Um, look at that. Parents play, if you talk, if parents looked at a study for HPV, um, nine, it was like they, the median value was 9.3, but only 5.2 were told anything about their provider because they didn't know anything about it because the provider um, never mentioned it because they didn't think the parent was interested. Next. So this is a big thing. The perceived and real concerns of parents influence how the clinician recommends and administers HPV. We can't go on perceptions. We need to go on data. Next slide, please. So we need to give an effective recommendation to receive HPV vaccine at ages 11 or 12. An effective recommendation from you is the main reason to decide to vaccinate. Many moms said that they trusted their provider and they get the vaccine as long as they got that positive recommendation from the provider. I mean, I had one provider who said to me, well, you know, I get vaccinated and um, this, the, this person got um, um, one uh, HPV anyway. It was one of the doses that wasn't covered by the vaccine. So, and that's what I said to her. I said, but this person had um, a strain that wasn't covered by the vaccine. So why would you not want to vaccinate? Next. So what is an effective recommendation? Next. Same way, same day. Next. So make that effective recommendation that, uh, that groups all of the adolescent vaccines. This shouldn't be, well, I have two vaccines for you and for meningitis and for whooping up. And then by the way, I have this other one, okay? Uh, you're gonna recommend all three at the same time. I have a vaccine for you that's going to prevent cancer, one that's gonna prevent whooping cough, and one that's gonna prevent meningitis. Don't distinguish it from the others because then it's like, well, why should she distinguish it? What's different? Uh, maybe I shouldn't really get this one. Next. Your preteen needs these the three vaccines today to protect against meningitis, HPV cancers, 
and pertussis or whooping cough. Make sure you use the, the generic names for them too, because a lot of parents will say to you, but I don't know what they were talking about. They told me to get this vaccine, but I have no clue what it protects against. Next. Here's that bundle, all three together. We call it bundling those vaccines to give those preteen vaccines. Next. Now, all right, this is a, some scenarios for you um, uh, that you can use with your patients. So, Sophia's 11. She's due for three vaccines today. These will help protect her from the infections that cause meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis. We'll give all those shots at the end of this visit. Um, it's the, giving that pro um, message instead of saying, well, do you want these vaccines? Or let's think about these vaccines. You want to say, I want to vaccinate your children today. Next, please. Some parents are going to need more reassurance than others. And that's more, I found my lower socioeconomic groups were much more trusting and willing to give the vaccines I was recommending than some of my higher socioeconomic group parents who may have gone to Google University and looked things up themselves or gone or listened to what some actor or actress had to say. Because we do know that there are actors and actresses who know more about medicine than we do. So we have to make sure that we become the source of information for our parents, okay? Some parents just will take your word, at your word and give the all vaccines. Some might be interested, but they have questions and they need more reassurance from you. When you have that pro-vaccine message, uh, some of the things I've said to parents is, my two sons, my daughters-in-law have all gotten this vaccine. In fact, my one of my sons, when this vaccine was first introduced, before it was licensed for boys, he came home and he said to me, Ma, I heard there's this vaccine that prevents uh, warts. Um, can I get it? And I said, well, you know, right now it's not licensed for boys. But then a very dear friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Paul Offit, said to me, I vaccinated my boys. So that was good enough for me. And they were vaccinated before it was licensed for boys. Um, it was an off-label recommendation, and um, our provider agreed to do that for my sons. Um, but it's certainly something that um, when you're vaccinating your own family, share that with your, your patients. Because what that does is it increases their, their trust in what you're doing. Um, ask parents what their concern is and make sure that you're addressing their real concern. Well, I heard this on the internet, or my friend said this, or I, like that we were talking today. Um, I heard GBS, uh, this, I was a little scared because I heard my friend who got a flu vaccine got GBS. Ask more questions. Was it documented? Um, was a workup done? Because not everything, it's that whole chicken or the egg theory. Um, what came first? Next slide, please. Um, well, why does my child need HPV vaccine? Next slide, please. HPV vaccination is important because it prevents cancer. That's why I'm recommending your child start that vaccine series today. It prevents head and neck cancers. We can wipe out 90% of head and neck cancers if we can get this vaccine into everybody. And we can virtually eliminate cervical cancers as well. Next, please. Uh, well, what cancers are caused by these infections? Next, please. Okay. Certain types of um, uh, HPV, certain, certain types of HPV cause cancers of the cervix, vagina, vulva in girls and cancer of the penis in men and in both girls and boys, cancers of, of the anus and the throat. Um, I have a mostly Asian population now and I wasn't doing a very good job. I was trying everything to get these kids to take HPV vaccine. I was all of a sudden, I got through to the girls when I started talking about cancer of the cervix and some of the things that would have to happen if they had these cellular changes, then it took off like gangbusters but I was not being successful with the boys. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? So I inadvertently blurted out to one of the boys one day, this vaccine prevents cancer of the penis. And he said, oh, I think I want that vaccine. And then I thought I did something culturally inappropriate. So I went to a very dear friend of my husband's who is of Chinese descent and he's first generation. And I told him that I was talking about penises with boys was, did I make a mistake? And he said, oh no, he said, that's a good tactic to use. So now when I see the boys, I tell them right up front, this vaccine prevents cancer of the penis. 
And I very rarely get the boys um, having their parents say, no, they don't want it. Okay, next. Is my child really at risk for HPV? Next. It's a very, HPV is very common and a widespread virus that infects boys and girls. We can protect your child from these cancers and these diseases caused by these viruses by starting this vaccine today. I mean, that might be where you throw in that your children had it or your grandchildren or whomever. Next, please. Uh, why at 11 to 12 years of age? I mean, they're awfully young for this, aren't they? Next. Um, well, we put seatbelts on before we turn the car on, when we leave the driveway or after a near accident. You know, it's all about protection. We put those seatbelts on before we turn the car on. So that's why we want to get that vaccine on board ahead of time. Next, please. As with all vaccine preventable diseases, we want your child protected early. If we start now, that's one less thing for you to worry about. Also, your child is only going to need two shots if we start before age 15. If we start after that, then we have to give them three shots. So let's give that first a dose today. And then you're going to come back in six to 12 months for the second shot. Next. I'm worried that my child is going to see this as a green light to have sex. Next, please. We have lots of studies that show getting this vaccine does not make children more sexually active or start having sex at a younger age. Starting the vaccine is the right thing to do to protect your child for the future. Next. Um, how long can we wait and still give just two doses? Next. The two dose schedule is recommended if the series is started before the 15th birthday. But I don't wanna do that because you know, the longer we wait, um, the children get busier. It's harder to get them back here to us. Um, and why do you want to give them three shots when we can get away with two? Next, please. I have some concerns about the safety of the vaccine. I, I read these things at Google University that say HPV vaccine isn't safe. Do you really know if it's safe? Um, how many strains of cancer are there for the types listed? Cervical, vulva and penis, et cetera. The two most common strains are the, the ones that are um, in this vaccine. And then the next most common are the other, um, the other four strains that are, are in the HPV-9. Okay, um, so next slide, please. Uh, I know I've read those same stories in the media and online about vaccines. And I could see how that really was very concerning but I want you to know this vaccine has been studied for many years by many medical and scientific experts. Uh, and based on all of the data I have seen and tell them you've seen this because that's what the talks like this are about. I believe this vaccine is very safe. You know, there's all kinds of stories out there. Uh, any connection between vaccine and autoimmune disorders? Great question. No, there is no connection between vaccine and autoimmune disorders. And any of those stories that you may have read about um, tardive dyskinesias, which is that um, the, the spastic walking, and how, I mean, how many strains of each cancer are there? Um, a, a, how many strains of, and I can't see the rest of the question. Um, so if they would please read that to me. But in the meantime, let me just finish this one piece about um, the, the, um, the data. There's information out there saying that it causes ovarian failure. All of those studies have been total, and those those uh, those claims have been totally disproved. Um, that was a um, uh, so there was one person that had they weren't able to walk and they were walking like every single muscle in their body was contracted. Um, that child was seen to have a conversion reaction and it had nothing to do with the vaccine. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and in regards to that last oh, thank you. Uh, last question. So Amy wrote, I mean, how many strains of each cancer are there? Example, how many strains of vulvar ca cancer are there? How many penile, et cetera? Well, it's it's based on how many how many of the cancer causing strains cause that. So you could be infected with one strain, but we could protect you from another strain that could cause um, that could cause cervical and or head and neck cancer. So um, it's, it's um, you can, 
it could it would cause the same disease but caused by the other strains the the 6 and 11 are the most common co cancer causing strains so if you had cancer related to because i mean this was the issue i had with this this pediatrician she knew a child who had um i think uh, or, well it was an older adolescent or, or a young woman had cancer related to um strain 11. so she saw no purpose in vaccinating but you can protect them against all those other strains by vaccinating because they could still come down with those strains after you go and you take care of the one strain that they've been infected with. Um, did, I hope if that doesn't answer the question. Can the that that um, can that person please ask me another question? Okay. All right. Now you want to also make sure you tell parents that the children can faint because they hold their breath, they don't eat, they don't drink, they come in hungry um, and just warn them that they can faint so that they don't get upset when their children do faint. So make sure that you tell them that's why you're gonna have their child seated when they, you give the vaccine. Okay, next slide, please. Could HPV cause my child to have problems with? Next slide. No data that ex affects the, uh, the uh, future fertility, which is the ovarian failure that some people have claimed. But women who develop cervical cancer could require treatment that could limit their ability. And this is where you tell them about how if they get these cervical changes, they're gonna start poking at the cervix, which can ultimately affect uh, long-term um, fertility in their, their children. So you wanna prevent that. You wanna prevent them from getting those infections. Um, next. Uh, I get that, but how many strains of each specific cancer exist? For example, I can then, uh, could you read me the rest of the question, please? For example, how many strains of cervical cancer exist? How many strange, strains of vulva cancer exist? Well, there's probably over 30 strains that, that exist. There's, there's actually hundreds of strains caused by HPV, but we're more concerned with the ones that are the oncogenic or the cancer-causing strains, which are the ones that are covered by the vaccine. That's why they've expanded this vaccine out to cover these additional strains, because after the first two that were put in the vaccine, the ones that are the most common, the next most common, are the ones that are in the vaccine. And we've seen that we can eliminate these cancers by the data we have from Australia, where the vaccine is mandatory, and they have seen a virtual elimination of head and neck and cervical cancers. Amy, are you asking how many different types of cervical cancer there are? Next slide, please. All right, so we have more than a decade of HPV vaccine safety studies um, that have been re very reassuring. We haven't seen any signals that shows us HPV causes death, neurologic conditions, autoimmune conditions, venous thromboembolism, post or uh, postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome, or complex regional pain syndromes. So there is your answer to give to parents. Um, some of the people that were claiming the vaccine, um, uh, were, were linked, the anti the anti vaccine sites were claiming the vaccine was linked to these deaths. Um, there were three. There were three deaths. One was a cancer unrelated to HPV. Another one was a murder, and the third one was a car accident. But because the student had been vaccinated within 90 days, the anti the anti vax community tried to claim that the vaccine was somehow linked. Okay, next slide, please. How do you know if the vaccine works? Next slide, please. We have studies that continue to look at these, um, um, at the rates of, of infections, HPV infections, genital warts and cervical precancers in young people have all decreased, even in the United States where we don't do a good job of getting all this vaccine into the children, but we still started to see a drop in the, in the number of, of, uh, um, of these conditions. So starting this vaccine today is the best way to ensure that your child gets the best protection available. Next, please. Well, why do the boys need the vaccine? Next. 
This infection can cause cancers of the penis, anus, and throat in men. And also they can be the source of the infection in the females. And it also can cause uh, the genital warts. So getting this vaccine today is the best way to protect your son um, against these infections that can lead um, to future diseases. Next. Um, is there a relationship with developing seizures among children with autism? Absolutely not. I can't tell you how many children with autism I gave this vaccine to. And there is, they've got really good data that shows it has no relation to seizures in children with autism. Um, well, we only want the vaccines needed for school. Next. All three of these vaccines are strongly and equally recommended by CDC. And they're also recommended by the pediatric, adolescent, and family medicine physicians and groups. Um, school entry requirements don't always reflect the current recommendations for your child's health. And this might be another place to say, my children or I got it as well. Uh, is there any difference between the types of cervical cancer and the strains? No, types and strains are pretty interchangeable. Okay, next slide, please. Would you get the vaccine for your children? I think I've been telling you all along that I certainly would. Um, next, please. Yes, I gave them to my child. Well, my children, I gave them to my two sons and then my daughters-in-law really, I've got it. And I really believe strongly in the importance of this cancer preventing vaccine. Why is I, would I as a parent not wanna protect my child against cancer? The a American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, National Institute of Health Cancer Centers, CDC also agree that getting this vaccine is very important for your child. Next, please. Uh, when do we need to come back? Next. Since your child's younger than 15, she'll also need a second shot in six months to a year. So when you check out, make that appointment, put it on your calendar, put it on your phone, and also texting the children themselves with, permission, with the permission of the parent is very helpful. Next, please. Okay. Since your child's already 15, they need to come back in one to two months and the third shot's due from six months today. Let's make all of those appointments today and put those and put little timers on your phone for you so that you won't forget. Next, please. If a parent doesn't say yes today, clarify and restate their concerns to make sure you understand their question. Emphasize that it's there. These are advise, acknowledge, and ask. Emphasize that it's the parent's decision. Acknowledge the risks and conflicting info. Um, and applaud them for wanting to do what's best for their child. And be clear that you're concerned for their safety um, of their child and not just the public health safety. Um, advise them and give them time to discuss the pros and cons of the vaccine and be willing to discuss the parents' ideas. Give them written resources and tell your advice to um, the presentation. Could I see that question again, please? Um, and tell your advice using this presentation. These slides will be made available to you. There's links on here that you can use for the handouts and for the, the, um, the posters and things. Um, Wait, telling your advice to the parent, what, you know, what the parent's concerns are. Um, and, next slide, please. Oh, and we did have a question. Tony yes, asked, I, do- I, it, I, it, it, it went away before I was able to see the full question. Go ahead. I've got it for you. Tony asked, do both injections have to be given before 15 or just the first one? Both of them. If you don't get the two shots into them with a six month interval before age 15, then you have to use the three dose schedule. Okay, thank you. So how do we get these numbers up? Know what your coverage rates are in your practices. Um, school nurses, I mean, here in New York, our school nurses in, in our, our neck of the woods, the school nurses also put the HPV vaccine on this children's school, school, school um, immunization cards just so they have all their vaccines in one place. And I cannot emphasize the registry to you enough. Having that registry, it's going to clue you when you need to come back. It's going to tell you what they've had. I mean, my husband today was at the provider's office and he got an extra pneumonia shot because the provider didn't look at the registry before she gave him the shot and he had had it already. So use those, use those registry, um, use the registry, use your data from your, uh, your um, electronic health records um, so that you know where to target these children. Next. Next. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, these are the top 10 li lists, the top 10 for HPV success. 
So you can also get this off the CDC website. Does it cause any harm if additional shots given past their series? No, it never hurts to give too many more, but why do you want to pinch them if you don't have to? Because it hurts. Next slide, please. So align your communication with your mission. Make sure everybody in your office is as pro-vaccine as you are. You don't want the front desk lady saying, well, you know, you're getting vaccines today, but whatever. Um, everybody needs to be giving that same message. Use the, this is a nice tip sheet that you can get off CDC's website. Share that among your staff. Do an in-service. Um, you can even get this whole slide deck and download it and talk to them about it. Next. Uh, Yes, you can get these slides. Um, they will be made available to you. They are really great. My friends in CDC, that, like I said, I don't make this deck up. It comes from them. And this is a screenshot of, of how you can get those slides right from CDC's website. Next slide, please. Um, so HPV is, uh, vaccine is cancer prevention. We are the key to preventing cancer. We're all healthcare providers and we're in the business of stopping illness. And by being proactive with this vaccine, we can stop these, these illnesses from occurring. Um, next slide. And I think this is my last one. Okay. Okay. Oh, Caitlin's got it right there. These are my references. And um, you, uh, you can, uh, the one that I just gave you for the updated recommendations, the, any ones that are highlighted there, if you get these deck, this deck on your computers, you can just point and click their live, um, their live um, um, links. Next. And, all right. So if you guys have any more questions and answers, I'm happy to answer them. And I cannot thank you all enough for having the interest in this very important topic that is a, on, for this life-saving vaccine. Terrific. Thank you, Mary. Well, um, thank you all for coming today. And when you're thinking about this, if you want to use my grandma as a, an example, please do so. If you want to use my family, say, you know, that I had a male family member who had this disease and what could have been prevented, please do so. My bottom line is I don't want any other family suffering from this disease like my family has. So Perfect. thank you very much for participating today. Thank you. And um, Mary, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for just a minute, um, oh, yeah. you can also take some uh, questions in the chat box even after we end the presentation, but I'm happy to do that. Terrific. So let me just remind everyone uh, as part of, let's see, Caitlin, could you, thank you. Uh, there is the next webinar that's coming up is uh, publishing in the Journal of School Health on October 31st. So if any of you have any interest in that, please feel free to join us. Check out our website for registration. Uh, also want to let you know that continuing education is available for this webinar. And as I mentioned, it's free for members. For non-members, you can purchase uh, that for $30 uh, for the one hour. Um, and you can obtain your CE by completing the webinar evaluation that Caitlin will put in the chat box, I believe. And just one more um, reminder to uh, join us in Cincinnati in uh, October 2019. I know it sounds like it's far away, but it'll, it'll come fast. So thank you so much for your help or for, for your attendance today. And uh, Mary's going to stick around and we can um, answer some of those questions in the chat box. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. And someone did say that they missed the first part of the presentation, but did you discuss the insurance companies slash Medicaid will cover the vaccine for 27 to 45 year olds? Um, that hasn't been clarified yet, but they said uh, from what I've, I've heard from the data is once it comes, once it's published, then the insurance companies will come on board and, and cover it for the 27 to 45 year olds. And someone else asked, I didn't put that slide in because I, it, you know, I, I, I had, it wasn't a firm recommendation yet, but just based on past experience, it may take a, a couple of months, but the insurance companies will come on board. 
Great. And then someone else asked, can women in their early 20s, non-sexually active women, yet still get it? Would it be three doses? Oh, you betcha. And I want them to get it the sooner, the better. Um, because we want um, the best time to give this is before their sexual debut. So if you've got women in their early 20s who have not been sexually active, but you know, when we say sexually active these days, it's not just vaginal sex anymore. So regardless, if you've got women in their 20s and they haven't had the vaccine, please do give it to them. And then Emma wrote, the CDC says children just need to start the series before the age of 15, not complete the two-dose series before 15. That's incorrect. You're reading it incorrectly. They have to finish the two-dose series before the age of 15. If they do not, then they have to have three doses afterwards. And Elizabeth writes, if you get the vaccine now as an older adult who has been sexually active with multiple partners, thanks to the new allowance, have a good, have as good protection than someone under the age of 15? The immune system does not work as well the older you get. But if this person has not, it does not at the time of vaccination um, been infected with any of the strains covered by the vaccine, they will receive good protection. And I think you saw the data there. I think it's like in the high 80s uh, for the protection against those strains. If they have already been infected with one or more of those strains, they will not receive protection against those strains, but they will pre be protected against other strains. These are great questions. They I really are really yeah. wonderful questions. Yeah, any others? You're welcome to, to um, type them in the chat box. And for those of you still on, I will be sending out an email within the next few days with the evaluation link if you haven't had a chance to do that, as well as the slides. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for that, Caitlin. Uh, so I think hearing no further questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, oh, one more. So I get resistance from young women wanting this, thinking they are non-sexually active. Is there a good line to say? What's your advice, Mary? My advice to them is I'm thrilled you're not sexually active because you are the best person to get this vaccine because you are going to get the best protection because it works the best in people who have never been sexually active. So then when you do find a partner to spend the rest of your life with, you will be protected because you never know where that other person has been. So you won't have to worry. Terrific. Any more questions or comments? 